Hi, everyone. Anne Louise Gittleman here for the First Lady of Nutrition podcast. And as many of you know, I've been rewriting the rules of nutrition now for over 40 years. I've championed a new way of looking at diet, a new way of looking at detox, the environment, and now longevity. So check out Radical Longevity on Amazon.com. And now we're going to be talking about a topic that I write about in Radical Longevity, which is the ageless way of eating and anti-aging. And today I have a very renowned cookbook author, Sandra Woodruff, with me, who has written over 20 cookbooks and is very knowledgeable about aging, advanced glycation and products, which most of you don't know anything about but need to. So Sandra, welcome to First Lady. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay, so my question to you is, I found with my research in my recent book that ages is one of the most remarkable discoveries or uncoveries, better said, in the 21st century. So tell us what ages are and how important they are to every disease condition known to man. Well, AGEs, very simply, it's a a compound that forms when sugars react with proteins or lipids. And what happens is it's very, um, it's complicated, but simple at the same time. So you've got a a protein or a lipid reacting with sugar. This is a process known as glycation. And a lot of people have probably heard this word glycation, especially if somebody has diabetes, they may have heard of glycated hemoglobin, which is a test you use to monitor blood sugar. So, So anyway, this glycation happens and then this compound goes through a series of transformations And it ultimately ends up being um, advanced into something that's toxic. Uh, And there are hundreds of different kinds of AGEs. Um, Some are toxic and some aren't, but there are enough of them that that are toxic that they are wreaking havoc. And every body, um, every organ system you can think of, they're widespread in our bodies and they just cause all kinds of problems. And just to bring this home to many of my listeners who are avid dieters, and food aficionados. How high in ages, this advanced glycation end products are some of the current diets, including keto. I wanted you to speak to that and the concept of keto ages and bacon, for example, as well as butter and cheese. Oh, right. Um, well, this can be a problem depending on you know one's particular diet choice because the foods that are highest in AGEs are animal, pro- animal foods that are high in protein and fat. So therefore, if you've got somebody on a keto or a low carb type diet who's eating a lot of animal foods, high in protein and fat, especially if they're cooked in a, with high dry heat, which is the main theme of the book, um, they're going to be getting an overabundance of these AGEs, just pouring in with every single meal. So people could be losing weight on a high ages diet, but aging at the same time. Right. They, they could be losing weight, but at the same time, accumulating a bunch of toxic AGEs all throughout their body tissues. Yes. So keto may not be the way to go for an anti-aging diet. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, it wouldn't be my preference. No. Okay. <laughs> although, although, you know, we do, um, we do get into, you know, no matter what kind of a diet a person is on, um, they can always make it more ageless by applying proper cooking methods. But, but that said, it's, it really is a whole lot better to go with a Mediterranean style, a more plant-based kind of a diet, because you'll automatically be getting in a lot fewer AGEs. How are they first discovered? Well, it's very interesting. My co-author, Dr. Helen Blasara, um, she um, came over from Greece in uh, the 1970s to work at Rockefeller University. Uh, she was working on a team that was looking at blood conditions um, in people who are um, of Mediterranean descent, so certain kind of blood disorders they were looking at. And so often this happens in science, you start looking at one thing and you end up going down a totally different road. So what happened was they were looking at these blood disorders when they noticed that hemoglobin, which is the protein in the blood that carries oxygen, um, that sugar could latch onto hemoglobin. And it made this compound that nobody really um, had become aware of before. So as they did more work on it, they realized that people who had a lot of sugar in their blood, as in diabetes, had more of these complexes where sugar was bound to their hemoglobin. And and ultimately, this led to the discovery of hemoglobin A1C, which I mentioned earlier, as a marker for diabetes. And they noticed that uh, people with diabetes who had a lot of these AGEs, they seem to get complications that you see with diabetes a lot faster 
um, such as eye disease, you know, peripheral vascular disease, heart disease. And so they noticed that not just people with diabetes, but older adults accumulated a lot more um, of these kind of glycated molecules. And, and they ultimately discovered that it wasn't just hemoglobin, it was other proteins in the body also that were becoming glycated and transformed into these advanced glycation end products. And ultimately they became markers for accelerated aging, uh, which is why they called them AGEs, the advanced glycation end products, because they seem to be markers of aging. So besides diabetes, now you mentioned peripheral <clears throat> circulatory issues, and I know kidney diseases are part of that too. Can you yes. mention the other diseases or disorders that are connected to ages? Oh, every organ you can think of, because once these AGEs form, they, they travel to every single organ and tissue in your body. So from your blood vessels, um, you know, one of the things that happens when you ingest AGEs is the body sees them as foreign substances or irritants, and therefore it mounts an invasion, an inflammatory response to get rid of them. So now you've got this chronic underlying inflammation. As long as you have these AGEs pouring in with your diet, um, your immune system is constantly overstimulated. So now you've got, um, you know, inflammation, which is most people are aware is kind of like underlies every chronic disease you can think of from diabetes to heart disease, dementia, and, and more. So that's, that's one thing that sets the stage for disease in every part of the body. The other is that these AGEs, they attach to tissues and proteins and lipids all throughout your body. So therefore they can affect every organ you can think of. So for instance, with cardiovascular disease, they will eventually make the, um, the blood vessels stiffen because the AGEs are sort of like a glue or a Velcro. They attach to um, proteins and they make them stiffer. And so therefore they can't expand and contract you know, as normal. And then your blood vessels become stiffer. So now you're setting the stage for cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, you've also got the inflammation going on, which is a double whammy. And there are many other problems like it'll, it'll attack your, um, your LDL and your HDL cholesterol. It will modify those um, because once these AGEs attach to your proteins, their structure and function becomes modified or altered. They no longer function normally. So now your LDL cholesterol becomes more dangerous. It's more likely to form plaques in your arteries. Your HDL cholesterol, which is normally the good cholesterol, that is no longer to have the benefit that it used to have. So you've got all these things going on at once because the AGEs are so pervasive. So if they cross-link proteins, which is what I think you're saying, and they yes. can stiffen arteries, then what yes. would that do to the skin? Everybody is so concerned about sagging, wrinkling, bagging skin. Everybody's taking collagen, vitamin C, yes. um, lysine, and proline. Don't you think it's more important to get rid of the ages when it comes to this? Absolutely. Uh, it's always better to address the root cause of anything. And this is no exception. And so if you think about the skin, it's got a lot of collagen and elastin in it, the, the proteins that make up the skin and give it suppleness and um, elasticity. Um, and, and therefore, when you've got these AGEs attaching to your proteins in your skin, it becomes less elastic, more likely to sag, um, more likely to wrinkle. Um, it's uh, more difficult for wounds to heal. So you, you, it just really, your skin is an organ, the largest organ of your body. And it, it basically, you know, degrades the integrity of that organ. So can this cross-link proteins <clears throat> in the muscles, tendons, and ligaments, so, so people think they get arthritis as they get older, when in fact, it's just a cause, it's just a symptom of age accumulation, AGE accumulation? The AGEs are part of that, most definitely, because if you think about these AGEs then attaching to muscle proteins, um, over time, they can't slide past each other because they're sticky, they're stiffer, um, that, that in your joints as well, the, the cartilage in your joints becomes defective, uh, your bones become more fragile because the collagen matrix has become, you know, ridden with AGEs. And so all of this, the joint stiffness, the, you know, the muscle stiffness, the sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass, uh, the bone density loss that occurs with aging, um, all of these are related to an overabundance of AGEs in the modern diet. So how come nobody's talking about it? 
I, I just it. wrote yeah. about it, by the way. I'm hey, trying to revive you. but but thank you. This is, this is it's very frustrating because this is such a remarkable discovery, uncovery. Yeah, gem, well, and nobody's been, writing about it. I know it, it's shocking to me. It's been called a missing link. Um, one of the you know one of the things that explains why the modern heat process diet is so de detrimental to our health. It's AGEs are a huge part of that. Um, and I'm shocked because if you do a search on PubMed, where they, you know, most of the scientific literature is published, I did one last night just to see how many articles were out there. I just typed in advanced glycation end products, over 13,000 journal articles came up. So it's not like it's not being researched. There are many, many scientific studies of high quality that have been done on this subject. I just do not understand why it's not more out there. Well, maybe it has to do with the fast food and processed food industries, which deliberately profit by creating foods that are so high in ages, <laughs> that are so addicting. I mean, what role do you think ages play in this? Well, the modern diet, uh, no doubt, uh, manufacturers try to make their food as tasty as possible. They want to create that bliss point of sugar, salt, fat, and also AGEs that make food so irresistible that you can't stop eating it. And of course, they, they want to make money. So, um, you know, the more food that's sold, the more money the shareholders make. And there's no incentive for anybody to, to you know, educate people about AGEs because they would have to rethink the way they eat. So we're talking about chips are high in ages, crackers are high in ages. Even so-called health foods that you might be able to name could be hidden sources of ages. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, the um, AGEs, uh, have you, most people, have, many people have heard of the Maillard reaction. Anybody who's a chef, does a lot of work in the kitchen anyway, knows about this. It's the browning reaction. You know, what happens when you sear a steak or you toast bread? Um, it, it makes, it creates this wonderful aroma and it intensifies the flavor. It makes foods crispy. Um, that's what's going on. That, that's how you know AGEs are being formed. And it's one way. <laughs> the, the, better, yeah. the, the yeah. better the aroma, the more ages you'll be. Yeah, and then, you know, chefs have been, have known this for, you know, a long, long time. They use it to their advantage in, in the yeah. kitchen. But there are still some other ways that, that you can make your food a lot very tasty without having to, you know, create all of these AGEs in the process. But, well, I want, to, I want to get to those in a moment. But but basically, they're foods. So let's get clear: they're foods that are innately high in ages, which are mostly your animal products. Can you name them for us, please? Right, animal foods, especially those that are high in fat and protein. So that would be meat, especially beef would top the list of the meats that are high in AGEs. Um, next in line would be um, pork and poultry, and then down the line would be um, eggs and fish, and th those are going to be the lower AGE protein sources, eggs, fish, and of course, legumes, as in dried beans and peas, would be um, the lower on, on, the, on the chain of the AGE. So therefore, people who would eat more fish, more eggs, more legumes are going to be much better off from an AGE standpoint. Now, and then there are also some dairy products that are going to be very high in AGEs, um, namely butter and cheese. Um, now, milk itself is not very high in AGEs, and this has to get with to the, um, the issue of water. Um, water inhibits AGE formation, so foods that are dehydrated, as in cheese, you know, cheese used to be milk, it's had the water taken out of it, so that's, that's one reason why cheese is going to be very high in AGEs compared to milk. Um, milk and yogurt tend to be quite low, um, so you've got, um, you've got meat, you've got uh, cheese, you've got butter. Um, those are those are the really the top ones, things like bacon, of course, um, any kind of animal fat. Um, so those are going to be the worst ones. The best foods would be any kind of plant foods, uh, dried beans and peas, you know, for protein. Um, any kind of fruits and vegetables are all going to be quite low in AGEs. The milk and the yogurt are quite low in AGEs. Fish and eggs um, tend to be lower. Uh, so really, it kind of boils down to, you know, a lot of the plant versus animal. How interesting and animal foods are so much in the forefront today with the paleo diet, the carnivore diet, and of course, the keto diet that we've covered. Right. And so right. this is quite an anomaly to say the very least. What about cooking with something like ghee? Pardon? Cooking with ghee. 
the separated. Uh, ghee, well, well, because um, ghee is butter, so it would also be quite high in AGEs. What we recommend is olive oil as the primary cooking fat. Uh, olive oil is, is quite a bit lower than butter and AGEs. What about coconut oil that's so popular today? That one I have not seen analyzed yet. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Well, olive oil it is. Olive yeah. oil it is. We love olive oil, whether it's yeah. on a salad dressing or in a stir fry or a little saute. You can't go wrong with olive oil. You can never go wrong with olive oil. So there's a lot to be said for the innate sources of ages and foods. What about the cooking methods? Can you go into those a little bit? Which one's the most deleterious? Okay, the most deleterious would be high dry heat. So anytime something gets um, like roasted in an oven um, or, or baked or broiled or grilled or even deep fried in fat, um, people don't often think of deep frying as a dry heat method, but there's no water you know, in, in that uh, you know, deep fryer. It's all pure oil. Water and oil don't mix. So that's a dry heat method as well. And one of the worst ones, by the way, because you've got all that oxidizing fat um, added on top of everything else, um, and that drives AGE formation. So, uh, so anything that's high dry heat, roasting, grilling, baking, broiling, that sort of deep frying, that sort of thing. Can you do any of those things, but, but with any tricks of the trade? In other words, can people grill? So many people are grilling these days, Sandra. I mean, it's going to be a hard pill to swallow, quite frankly. What can you do to reduce the ages if you're a grill fanatic? Yeah, I agree. That's that's probably the biggest pushback I hear is now I have to give up my grilled chicken. Really, um, after I've given up everything else, well, you can you can reduce AGEs by marinating it in something acidic, because acid inhibits that reaction, that glycation reaction. So, um, lemon juice, wine, vinegar, um, that sort of thing. If you if you put that chicken or whatever you're grilling in a marinade first. Um, and let it marinate, you know, for a good several hours at least, or maybe overnight, um, that's going to dramatically reduce the, the, um, the generation of AGEs. Then the other thing is just don't cook it to death. Um, just cook it till it's done, you know, till it's safely done, the right temperature, um, but not to where it's all dried and shriveled up. So that means no more jerky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a safe, yeah, safe bet, yes. That'd be safe to say. Yeah. So if you were to have a Thanksgiving turkey meal, how do you prepare it? I want to give people a very visual idea of how to prepare an age free meal that is a celebratory meal. How would you do Thanksgiving? Well, one, I would do normal Thanksgiving. Um, the one, of, one of the points that we like to make is that you can balance high AGE meals with lower AGE meals. And you can do this over the course of a day. For instance, if you know you're going out to dinner and you know you're going to eat something high in AGEs, well, then balance it out with low AGE meals the rest of the day. And the same thing goes for Thanksgiving. Um, although I have, um, I did analyze a sample. I did, I usually do my turkey in a, um, like one of those, I, I put it in a pan and I put some wine, like about a cup of wine in the bottom of it and then cover it with foil. And it basically steams in, in the foil. And that turned out to be much lower in AGEs than a regular, uh, you know, oven roasted turkey would be. So uh, just, you know, letting it steam in some wine while it's cooking, um, in that case, seemed to help a lot. So how do people actually measure, you know, in the book, I give them lists, which are actually taken from your research with Dr. Lucera. I give them listings of different foods and different food groups, but how can people access a manner, in, in, they may be researching their own age level, ages level, I should say. Is there any system out there? In other words, can you go to a lab and get your ages measured? Well, only in research settings right now. And, and, you know, I really, to be honest with you, don't think it's all that important because what really matters is to take a look at your diet. It's easy to see if you're taking in a lot of AGEs, you know, if you're eating a lot of processed food and grilled, baked, broiled food, jerky type foods, you're eating a high meat diet, high fat diet. Um, it's easy to ascertain that you're getting in way too many AGEs. And so we don't recommend that people get caught up in trying to count them or try to measure what's in their blood or any of that stuff, because it's, it should be much simpler than that. I hope so. With my readers, you never know, but that's good. I'm <laughs> going to quote you. So back again to the reason that this is not as well known. Do you think it's because it, it impacts the fast and processed food industries? I mean, obviously, Ages were first identified in the late 70s to early 80s, and yet they're largely 
underplayed, ignored in the, in the general public, even though there are over 30,000 articles, as you say. So any other reasons that you think other than the definite hit against the fast and processed food industries? Well, so often with research, you know, a lot, a lot of times it gets published because there's some particular uh, group that likes, that wants to get that message out, like maybe with avocados or, you know, they've done a lot of marketing. Well, you know, the avocado board wants to sell more avocados. Um, you know, it's just hard to find somebody to carry the banner for, you know, a basic message, eat more fruits and vegetables and less animal foods, you know, it's, it's just hard to find somebody who wants to pick that banner up and, you know, run with it. Are there any particular antioxidants on the market these days that can lower the age's content of food? Uh, nothing that's definitive. We, we talk about a few of them in the book. Um, you know, there's been some research on uh, supplements like uh, benfotiamine, for example, which is a lipid soluble form of thiamine or pyridoxamine, which is the B6. Uh, thiamine, a, a form one form of thiamine. There's been, you know, some some people looking at that, but there's nothing that's really a miracle cure. Uh, the best thing is always to do the root cause, which is too many AGEs coming in with the diet. Cut back on the dietary AGEs, and um, you know the problem is going to be addressed that way most most effectively and the best way. And tell me about herbs and spices, anything particularly high in antioxidants we should be looking for to cut the ages in foods? Well, there's a whole host of herbs and spices, just about any of them. Uh, they're all loaded with various phytochemicals, and many of them are being studied now. I mean, basil, oregano, you know, you name it, all of them are being looked at for their properties because of their antioxidants. And, and many of them do contain um, substances that might help trap or neutralize AGEs, but there's just not a lot of definitive work on it to say, you know, you know, one particular herb is better than another. It's just, you know, having a wide variety of these herbs in your diet on a regular basis. They're good for a lot more than just AGEs. Good point. Uh, in my book, Radical Longevity, I place a lot of emphasis on rosemary and thyme, and certainly thyme because in the age of COVID, we know that thyme wall is a very important antibacterial, antiviral. So using those in addition to everything else that I know that you write about, I think is really good medicine to say the least. So do, phys do physicians know anything about this? Or has the banner been picked up by any physicians in mainstream medicine at all? Uh, surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, uh, almost nobody talks about AGEs in the medical world. Uh, I mean, there are a few outliers out there. Some of the functional medicine people do mention them, um, but I just don't think anybody's giving it the, uh, the attention that it deserves. I mean, the idea of how, how you cook could be just as important as what you cook is very profound. Very profound. So how should we cook? Tell us about the ageless cooking methods that are the most advantageous. Well, anything with moist heat. So there would be things like um, braising. Uh, and a lot of these principles that, uh, that fit in with ageless eating are very uh, congruent with the Mediterranean diet. So braising, poaching, stewing, steaming, uh, slow cookers are a good way to go. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. So in papio, that's another good one, cooking in parchment. So anything that's going to trap in steam while you're cooking is, a, is soups and stews are ideal for ageless cooking because you get a, you know, not, you get some protein as in like chicken or, or, you know, beef or whatever, but not an outrageous amount. It's cooked in a simmering broth with lots of vegetables. That would be an example of a really good ageless kind of a meal. So do you think that mainstream medicine is biased, again, is biased towards the use of drugs to manage disease rather than focus on preventing it in the first place? Do you think that could be one of the issues here? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Um, there's very little training about nutrition and, and lifestyle in general in medical school, even though there's been a lot of talk about it, it's recognized as a problem. But still, there's very, very little um, attention given to to these kind of topics in medical school. Doctors just don't know a lot of this stuff. And of course they do have a lot of other stuff they have to study, but it's just easier to prescribe a pill or, you know, and just, you know, it's sad, but true. 
So how does the lead researcher was Helen Blasera, if I'm not mistaken, how does yeah. she regard all this? Is this something that's frustrating her because she's been working so long at getting this word out? Oh, most definitely, right? She feels exactly the same way. And um, uh, the reason we got together was I had been studying this research since, oh gosh, I think I saw my first article on AGEs in a medical journal um, probably 25 years ago. And I was so intrigued by it. She had written an editorial called uh, something like um, AGEs, are they the missing link in diabetes? It was talking mm. about, about the... Uh, the link between a high meat, high processed diet and diabetes. And she was putting out this question, can AGEs be the missing link? And I just thought that was so intriguing. And so I followed this research for the next, you know, probably 15, 20 years. Finally, I saw her speak at a conference and I approached her and I said, um, have you thought about writing a book about this? And she said, yes, yeah, she had thought about it, but just hadn't got around to it. And so we decided to collaborate because I really felt like this was a message that needed to get out there. So, so right. And so when did the book come out? Uh, 2017, the, the latter part of 2017. And the name of that book for my listeners is? Dr. Lasara's Ageless Diet. And is there anything else that's come out as well? Wasn't there an age food guide? Yes, we did do a small um, AGE food guide, which is basically a, a quick reference to foods and their AGE content. So people can kind of flip through the book at a glance and see how they fit on the spectrum of AGEs. So how was the book received? Who was your public? I think I know your publisher. Was that Square One? Yes. Did yes. you do a lot of promotion for the book? Were you in, on cooking shows? That would have been a wonderful format. Yeah, we really haven't been on, on cooking shows. Well, one thing happened was, uh, I believe we had some, some bad economic times and we had a pandemic and uh, there been some, some oh, roadblocks along the way. Oh, that, yes. Yeah, yes, oh, that, yes. So where do you go from here with the message? Uh, just keep, you know, just keep doing interviews. We felt like you know, we wanted to write the book so that people would have access to the information and, um, you know, just get it out there the best we can. So you were the recipe developer in the book. Can you share with us any of your little secrets in terms of the recipe? Well, basically, you know, we use the same principles as that, first of all, understanding which foods are highest and lowest in AGEs focusing on those foods that are lowest and limiting the amounts that tend to be high. So a lot of plant foods, um, smaller amounts of meat, uh, using the right cooking methods. And, and the book uh, exemplifies those. We do things like soups and stews, salads, uh, braised dishes, and papio steaming, um, all of that. Um, and so and, and a lot of um, fresh, fresh salads, of course. And so we, we kind of went in that direction, exemplifying, you know, how to use the foods that are lowest in AGEs um, and how to cook them best. What about using the Instapot? What is your uh, feeling about that? Um, I am not familiar with the Instapot. I've heard of it, but that's one thing I haven't gotten around to yet. It's kind of a new, uh, a new version of a pressure cooker. Okay, well, um, when we tested some of these recipes, we did try a pressure cooker and it worked quite well because it holds, holds steam in. So that would be that principle of you know, moist heat cooking. So anything that's gonna hold in the steam would, would seem to be a good choice. So with all the research that you have done and certainly being a co-author on these books, what is it, your breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Would you share that with my listeners? Oh, sure. Um, for breakfast, um, I usually do some kind of uh, maybe a yogurt fruit um, with some walnuts or uh, almonds or something or a smoothie, um, maybe a hot cereal, hot grain cereal like um, made from brown rice or barley or, you know, some kind of whole wheat berries ground up, um, or some kind of a porridge, in other words, oatmeal, steel cut oats, um, eggs, of course, omelets. And I do, a, we do a whole chapter just on breakfast because there's some really good things you can do with eggs, omelets, frittatas, um, poached egg dishes. Um, so th those kind of things would be for breakfast. Lunch is depending on, you know, what my time is. A lot of times it ends up being a, a some kind of a sandwich. And, and this, this is a good tip here is that if you want to grill something, do something like a panini. So grilling bread 
is much better than grilling meat because you'll end up with many, many, many less AGEs in grilled bread than you will in grilled meat. So maybe it's like something like a tuna panini or an asparagus panini or a um, caprese with fresh mozzarella, um, basil and tomatoes panini. Um, I do it like a spinach panini. I, I love panini. Um, so that sort of thing, or salads, do a lot of salads with some kind of protein. Um, often it'll be maybe a poached chicken or um, some kind of um, lightly seared um, shrimp or scallops or salmon on top of a fresh salad. Soups are always a great lunch. And um, so that sort of thing for lunch. For dinner, um, uh, skillet dinners, we do quite a few of those in the, um, in the Ageless book where you just take uh, maybe some ground turkey or ground beef and you know make like a Mex Mexican skillet dinner or something like that, something quick and easy, have that have a salad on the side. Um, or maybe some, um, we do a lot of uh, simmered and braised chicken dishes or fish and papillote sort of things. Now tell me about snacks. That's the most difficult area, I think, to it is. customize. Uh Right. Uh, the problem with snacks is that people have come to think of snack food as something that comes in a package and is crispy or crunchy chips, pretzels, that sort of thing. Mm. That's just not, you know, not that should be like food you serve for a special occasion. Like when I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, we just didn't keep that stuff in the house. If somebody wanted a snack, they would have some real food, like some leftover something, leftover soup, leftover salad fruit, a handful of nuts, uh, that sort of thing. It just didn't eat any of that packaged stuff. And I think that's a, going back to that kind of a mindset would be a very good thing. Yogurt, that's another good one. So yogurt is a good one. What about the coconut yogurts, the cashew yogurts, same concept? The, yeah, the plant milks. Yeah, the plant milks are just fine. Yes. What about popcorn? Can you speak to that a little bit? I was surprised okay. to learn that that is one of the least ageless least aging foods. Yes, and then that would be another good example of a, of a really good snack. Popcorn is a whole food. It's got fiber. Um, yeah, and it does not form a lot of AGEs unless, of course, you pour a bunch of butter on top of it. Um, because the uh, when you cook plant foods, they will, they will accumulate some AGEs, but a minuscule amount compared to what happens when you cook meat. Do you think that you can actually reverse some of these the, the disease conditions by following a low ages diet? I mean, not just mitigate, but reverse. Well, Dr. Lasara has done some studies that indicate that um, you do get some benefit by going on the ageless diet. And in some of their studies, um, they would routinely um, take two groups of people. One group would be on their usual diet. The other would stay on their usual diet, but just be instructed to change their cooking method. So instead of um, you know, fried fish, they might do steamed fish, or instead of grilled chicken, they might do uh, chicken in the crock pot sort of thing. Um, and what they would find is just after a few months, the markers of inflammation would go down in their blood. Um, they might get um, uh, like less, um, uh, less insulin resistance. They, they've seen insulin resistance improve. Um, so they have seen, you know, things move in the right direction, um, even over a period of a few months. And they've also seen in people who have obesity, um, that when they put them on an ageless diet, um, that their insulin resistance got better. And over the course of a year on the ageless diet, they even lost some weight without even trying. They weren't instructed to cut back on food or calories or anything. They just said, cook your food differently. Um, over the course of a year, um, the group who had the ageless diet lost seven to 10 pounds without even trying. Uh, unbelievable. There's so much to be said for that. So this is an idea whose time has long come. Is there, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to impart to our audience as we close out the podcast? Um, I think we've covered it pretty well. It's just, I just want people to understand this is not anything that's difficult. Um, we can just start using more of these ageless cooking methods, um, like the, the moist heat, the marinades, that sort of thing, and start phasing out some of the older cooking methods and, you know, changing the amounts of the meat that we eat, more plant, less meat. It's really a simple thing, and it's very much in line with good health recommendations. It's very similar to a Mediterranean diet, and, and everybody likes that. 
Everybody likes that. That's a wonderful note to, to, to conclude our interview. Thank you so much, Sandra Woodruff. Any other books that you want to mention that you have co-authored or authored? Actually, you're an author in your own right. Uh, well, I did do one called The Fabulous Fiber Cookbook a couple of years ago that um, talks about uh, the benefits to having fiber in your diet. And it's got well over 100 recipes uh, of high, high fiber foods. So you walk the walk and live the talk. Oh, absolutely. I think healthy food can taste great and be good for you at the same time. I like that. And I want to thank you so much for being my guest today. Will you come back? Yes, thank you so much. You're entirely welcome. And I want to thank my listeners for tuning in to First Lady of Nutrition podcast. I especially want to thank my new sponsor, CS Health, who are the makers of Vitality and Vitality Plus, an indigenous broccoli enzyme activated dietary supplement that provides sulforaphane, one of the most important antioxidants ever. So tune in once again to First Lady of Nutrition. Lots of love, everybody. May you live till 120. everybody. I'm Ann Louise here with just one more thing. Thank you so much for being a fan of my work. And if you like this video, please check out all my other videos. Please subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications.